Uh, my name is Dr. Kelly Rotten. I am the Assistant Dean for Research and Education Services here in the University Libraries, and I am very pleased to introduce our first graduate research series speaker of the academic year. The graduate research series is a competitive opportunity for graduate students to share their research results and processes and hone their presentation skills while we get to learn more about their process and their research. Today's speaker, Umaru Abdullah Baralabi, is a first-generation college student from the Republic of Benin, West Africa. He was awarded the Fulbright Scholarship in January 2016 to pursue his graduate education at Ohio University. He is currently a doctoral candidate in higher education. His research interests are around students thriving, appreciative approaches, and access, equity, and diversity issues in post-secondary education. He has been engaged in various multicultural student organizations, both on and off campus. He's currently president of the Holmes Scholar National Council and the former president of the African Students Union and the Fulbright Scholar Association at Ohio University. He has received several awards and recognitions, including the Outstanding Graduate Student Leader Award for a doctoral student and four first place awards at last spring's Research Expo. Please join me in welcoming Amaru Abdullah Balarabi as he shares his research on the practices and experiences that contribute to student thriving in a public university in Benin. Thank you so much for that uh, wonderful introduction and thank you so much everyone for, for being here and to those who are online too, thank you so much for joining us. I want to say a special thank you to the you know, Ohio University Library for really what you do to support graduate student research and creative activities. We definitely do appreciate you. And today I'm going to be sharing um, some preliminary results about um, you know, my dissertation research that is still in progress. It's a intermixed method dissertation, but today I'm going to talk about the quantitative uh, phase of my dissertation. So I'm going to be focusing on the first phase. And as you can see, I'm definitely interested in looking at you know, experiences, so practices that contribute to student thriving. And I'm focusing on my home country. Um, the public university of my home country. Uh, this is my agenda for today's um, presentation and talk. Um, I'll be sharing a little bit of background, the importance of my studies, and then um, give an overview of the literature and some gap, and then talk a little bit about my conceptual framework and the purpose of research questions and what I, why is this study significant, so why, what am I adding to the corpus of the literature and then my design, um, result and preliminary recommendation because I'm still exploring the qual phase to really give me some holistic pictures in terms of what solid recommendations I, I can give. And then uh, I will end by talking about library resources that I use um, you know, in the process of, my, uh, of this research and then open up for some discussion. And I'm going to try as much as I can to project. I definitely do have a projective issue, so if you're not, Hear me, please let me know so I can increase my volume. Um, sometimes when I am really talking loud, I feel like I'm getting up to four. So I have internalized that so much. All right, so a little bit of background and many prominent researchers, and even recently um, with the African Union, with the Africa Agenda, the Africa We Want 2063, have really emphasized higher education as a strategic hat of education as, as a unique opportunity for the continent to um, you know, um, educate its youthful population to contribute to the transformative development of the continent. Right? We've, uh, over the years, we've, we've seen some increase in access to public higher education opportunities, um, but students really still face myriad of challenges. And despite this increase, really less or not much is done or known on how to support student thrive. And also that, that many factors actually really explain that in, in, in general, particularly in public higher education. In the, uh, and this is a Francophone environment, it's a French-speaking country, so it's drastically different from uh, Anglophone African countries in terms of the higher education system. Uh, but so despite, you know, despite this myriad of challenges, that many, so some students definitely persist, stay, and try and succeed. And, I'm just curious about what we really maintain or what you know, helps students succeed despite challenging learning environments sometimes. 
right? And so I'm arguing here that there is a need for uh, for us to study and understand students' private and technical experiences, and I'm also arguing that access without adequate support is not opportunity, and that student success does not arise by accident or by chance. And it's a, it's just important that we, um, you know. If we increase access, let's increase support and also see how students are doing in general. So a little bit of background or overview of the literature. I'm drawing from the student success, uh, you know, um, literally so I wanted to just make sure that, I, and this is not in, the, in, in any particular order, but over the years definitely there have been different, you know, theoretical perspectives that have studied really student success. So we had sociological perspective that really focus on, you know, academic and social integration and involvement that would tend to and that thing, how that affects student system. We have economic perspective that really focuses on price response model or cost benefit analysis and then cultural perspective that also usually focuses on challenges that make it difficult for historically or minoritized students in post-secondary education. Um, institutional structures are also related to the organization perspective of how policies Structures and, and, and anything you can that is related to or, you know, uh, organizational institutions that affect student behaviors or engagement or attitude. And then the psychological perspective that talks about individual and features or uh, um, psychological characteristics and motivations and that is that's been an interim recently that um, really focuses on student success and then ending up with really the conceptual framework that I'm using over here, which is more of a Sprint based approach to the success and it's also takes into account a number of these perspectives. So it's integrated in, in, in nature. And it is not that there's something necessarily wrong with um, any of this perspective, but they all have focused on specific aspect of student success and they have advanced our understanding on issue factors or practices or experiences that contribute to student success. I'm uh, using thriving because I'm interested in strength based approaches and looking at what is working, what can we leverage, what are students doing well, what are institutions doing well, and uh, what, what best practices can we learn and replicate um, you know, across institutions. So that's what I'm using um, thriving. All right, so the thriving literature really have focused um, particularly in, in the US culture that's focused on pathways, experiences that really you know, help students help students succeed, and even though different population, different student population have different pathways to thriving, there are four um, experiences or factors that have strong, regardless of student body, whether it's sophomore, first year, transfer student, first gen, grad student, there's four predictors, there's four uh, predictors, psychological sense of community, spirituality, campus involvement, and student faculty interaction have a strong influence on student thriving, right? Um, uh, some of the gap that I found definitely thriving research has largely focused on, on this contest, uh, which definitely uh, would have less implication on other contests. So my, what I'm adding here really, I wanted to see a cross-cultural application of the thriving framework, but also paying attention to the specific realities of the contest I'm studying. Um, I, for this quantitative phase, I used a thriving quotient instrument. I had to do what um, research is called uh, cross-cultural adaptation of instruments. I'm definitely not talking much about it here, but if you're interested, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it at some point. And that process really does allow me to make sure that the instrument that was developed in this context is working to some extent in my population. There were items that were not really relevant to um, the population that I studied, so I had to uh, get rid of some, some of those items and also run some new um, confirmation factor analysis to make sure that the instrument is measuring what it's supposed to measure. I'm also, again, even though over the years in, in, in the context in Benin, like in many African countries, um, they somehow, though there's some increase in access to public higher education opportunities, but particularly in Benin, there's also a lack of empirical research really about student success for education experience and, and educational and well-being experiences, and that's why I am doing what I'm doing. So the thriving framework, my the conceptual framework that I'm using really is thriving. And Schreiner, Lori Schreiner, who really developed this theory, really um, the way she framed it is the extent to which students are academically, socially, and psychologically engaged and enjoying the high education experience. That's what thriving means in this context. And thriving has three domains, and each domain is measured by one or two factors on the front end of uh, my graph. So as you can see that 
This, uh, the academic thriving asset is measured by two factors, in engaged learning, academic determination, and then uh, in interpersonal thriving is measured through one factor, positive perspective, and interpersonal thriving also is measured through two uh, factors, social connectedness, and diverse uh, citizenship. Um, so I did put the, there is some major predictors of thriving, as I mentioned, there is so many that measure certainty, that also, <coughs> Some, some institutional feed, institutional reliability that are all, you know, to some extent, depending on student population, you know, can predict different things. So I did add it to my constructive framework because to some extent it affects student traveling in general. So that's the, how I frame um, my study theoretically or conceptually. Uh, my purpose again is to identify activities, practices, or experiences that contribute to student thriving at a public university like the Benin, and I focus on I'll talk about um, the characteristics of my subject a little bit. And uh, since I'm focusing today on the first phase of my study, which is really a quantitative study, I ask two questions. And for hypothesis, but I ask two questions. The first is more the descriptive statistic question, where I'm really asking to an actor as a student based on those five factors that I just uh, shared. And here, I am curious about um, you know, those consistent thriving predictors and how they, work, or how they work in the population that I'm looking at. I wanted to see how well or how what the relation, I wanted to explore the relationship between campus involvement, psychological sense of community spirituality, faculty student interactions, and student thriving. How what, what's the relationship between those four predictors and, um, and student thriving? And this is because, again, like I said, um, even though different student population have different pathways to thriving, these four predictors have been consistent. And I wanted to see uh, that this, that this uh, on, the, on the student, uh, at least uh, the institution that I am doing this stuff. All right, what I hope many of this will have contribute as time I complete both the points and qualities. I'm hoping that um, at the institutional and student level, since thriving really focuses on you know, variables that are um, changeable both within the institution and student that it will allow more of a pragmatic intervention where institution get to see what is working both on student end and what they also do well so they can um, really focus on what is working. And in terms of policy, I'm hoping that since, um, you know, the framework that I'm using is mostly strength based. Um, I'm hoping that they, this can lead to some form of um, you know, policy and student centered program that are uh, student strength based, um, strength based, and student centered and strength based program of policies in general, depending on what the outcome uh, of this is. Well, of course, well, is definitely high student, I and mean, student affairs is not big in many of our countries, but there's definitely some form of it that is happening, right? And both with the Transportations and food services and couple of those, although there is an office of student affairs, but there is really not much being done. I'm hoping that you know that this would give them you know some you know, a better knowledge of student education experience and the support that students may need. I'm also hoping that by the time I complete this study, since I did a cross course adaptation of the instrument, the uh, tribal coaching instrument, I'm hoping to make uh, to validate the instrument in the French um, you know language that. Francophone countries can use, but of course, um, they may have to adapt it to their own context. They may have to retest it based on their need and stuff, but at least they have some way to start it from going back to the original. So that's definitely what I think would be like, the overall relevance of um, uh, what I'm doing. All right, this is again to give you guys, I mentioned earlier that I'm doing a, an explanatory sequential mixed method, but today I'm just focusing on this phase of my study. Um, and I'll be talking about um, just this phase and how I collected the data and, and I've analyzed it and what came out uh, as fun well today. So I'm not talking about a second and integration phase, but I'm still working on this phase um, definitely. So specifically, zooming on the, um, you know, the first phase, um, the sample characteristic I use, again, I use uh, a tribal quotient survey that has all the variables that I talked about that were questions, the questions or statements that really speak to those questions. And I, it's an online survey that I, I did with the book to, uh, thanks to the help of the university back when I was able to send it to students. And I use five academic colleges, and let's quickly go into the names, 
justify why I decided to focus on um, five academic colleges. So, but I, I did use a survey, and my sample, I focused on second and third year undergraduate students at a public university. Back in the native uh, Frankfurt environment, the uh, bachelor's degree is three years, and I hope it, at least students who have been able to progress from first to second year have made some progress, and I wanted to understand the experience here. You either have to be in your second year or final year to participate to in this study. And um, look at the sample characteristics. It's, there's a bit of diversity in the sample, but the five academic colleges that I, I use here is the College of Economics and Management, College of Social Sciences, and College of Law and Political Science, College of Humans, College of uh, Humanities, and Art and Communication. The reason why I focus on this in almost all from African countries, public universities have dual track. There's fee paying and low fee paying. Um, you know, fee paying are very selective, and low fee paying are really less selective as long as you pass your baccalaureate in the Francophone context, when you, which is a high school, which is a high, which is a high school living, uh, you know, exam. Once you pass it, you have access to these colleges that have this low paying fee. Um, you know, but it's still. Public, they're all public university being funded by Zona funders and the government, but they are different in terms of the way they select. The, 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 select, the most selective colleges, either, you either have to afford it, you either have to afford it or to have a high GPA from your high school um, living exam. And what that, is, what that is doing, see, can we keep quiet? <laughs> what, what that is doing, what that is doing, for example, from my own experience as someone who you know, I've been through the public school and I went through one of those, uh, you know, less selective. Um, so it has stratified access to public higher education um, by region, socioeconomic status, and usually also gender. But what, it, those that are, what is really apparent to me and that is, I think, problematic is particularly that those who access the uh, high paying or, or highly selective colleges, high, high, highly selective colleges that either come from households where both of their parents have attended college, or they come from the southern part of the country where they have you know, well equipped and well resourced public, I mean, high school, or they can attend private high school that really allow them to go out. So therefore, if you live in a rural area or if you live in a part of the country where you can't afford um, you know, to go to private school or you can't afford to, you know, to have a tutor, for example, at home where the chances are you end up in in, in this, and there's the numbers also in classroom, for example, in, in, in all these five academic, academic colleges that I chose is really plutoric. I do I do remember when I was uh, doing my undergrad in our first year, we were about 3,000 students that were divided into three or four groups and attended lectures in that three years. And so there's some challenges related to being, to going, you know, to attending any of these colleges. Uh, that, you know, that's what, what, one of the reasons why I selected um, there's five, you know, um, academic colleges, and I've also seen over many of the students that really have started over. The, when we started our first year, by the time we get to the third year, there was a lot of drop out in general. These are people who were not convinced. There's no data to explain why people are dropping out. So I, um, you know, this doing this research is both um, for me. It's, it's just my curiosity to understand why those who stay, those who are staying and persistent and thriving, what is helping them thrive, and what you know, um, what the institutions or the government or the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research, what can they do to support or replicate that across the student body, particularly in this uh, low-paying and less selective academic uh, colleges. I, I, for my first question, as I said, I guess do some descriptive analysis, and for the second question, it, lies, it lends itself simply to uh, multiple media regression analysis. For instance, I'm exploring a relationship between um, one independent uh, one independent variable and two or more uh, independent variable. Right, so for, for the descriptive statistics, what I really, what I found um, when I run the descriptive statistics on the five factors of um, of thriving, as you can see, and they rate themselves, um, you know, from one is a little scale from one to six, and so that the maximum score they can have a rating is six, the minimum is one. Um, as you can see, the mid score on they, they did really well, very well, I think, on the mid score 
for academic engagement, academic determination, um, diversity makes a positive perspective on with the exception of uh, social connectedness, um, which is also definitely more than half, a little bit um, more, than, more than actually halfway through the average score. But um, they did, when I did some of the interviews, I, I did get, uh, I got a little bit of um, why, because this is all about creating creating and maintaining positive relationships, right? So they either a student here because they're coming from low income family or they're coming from a less structured, um, I mean, very structured high school and coming into a public university where, which is very big and they're just trying to find themselves and many of them are not able really to um, hold certain um, relationships. They're focusing on academic integration, going into a new uh, university environment. So there is a lot definitely uh, that um, I can say about this when I finish analyzing my qualitative data to speak to this aspect, why, why this is uh, as low as this. But I think in terms of uh, the rest of the factors, they're definitely uh, thriving based on, on these factors. Um, but what is explaining that, definitely my course base will talk more about it. And in terms of the, the sp I also run some descriptive statistics on the, my, my, predict my predictors, as you can see here, also um, the mean score, the mean, the mean score here also, the lowest mean score that we have, I think, is faculty student interactions. And that would say a lot, that would say a lot, or we go to the regression analysis aspect of it. But I, again, uh, based on this result, based on this result um, there is some form of thriving that is happening. And um, my, the explanatory phase of this study will shed more light in terms of you know, how and why these things, these this factors or predictors contribute. But uh, this, these are numbers, and so when I run the, the, the overall model, regression model is significant with uh, an adjusted R score level of um, 49.7% uh, of student by, of student thriving is accounted or can be explained collectively by this four variable, by by this four this four variable together explain 49.7% of the variation in student thriving level. And, but when taken individually, as you can see with the P level, only faculty student interaction does not add anything significant to student thriving. And that, in a lot of ways, again, the interviews that I conducted, students talked a lot about uh, you know, what is affecting that relationship and why it might not be contributing. For someone who has, for someone who has been through, I want to move colleges, this finding is not surprising to me, given the class structure and the class size and the lack of um, you know, office hours, so any meaningful interaction between faculty and students, this is definitely not surprising to me. But again, um, I do have some, um, you know, based on my interview with students to find out what is the nature of their relationship with their faculty that help kind of shed light to, you know, um, sometimes this relationship is, is affected by uh, culture to some extent, which uh, students talk about, and hopefully by the time I finish analyzing my qualitative data, I can speak more, more to that. But again, overall, like the regression model is significant, but um, taken individually, only this factor, only factor of the student interaction does not add anything significant but to, uh, this, uh, to, to the model or to student driving in general. Um, so what am I saying here again? Too early for me to really make any solid recommendation without really analyzing my quant I mean quantitative data, but I'm really again going back to my argument that access without support is not opportunity. And if we, we are also arguing that success does not arrive by access or access, it has to be intentional. Um, uh, since spirituality came definitely as one of our strongest, as you can see, it's one of the strongest. Even when we go back here, spirituality has the mid score. The mid score in spirituality is the highest, right? So it's one of the strongest. Whatever it means to them, you know, in this context, Schreiner talks about belief in something bigger, right? But when I talk to students, they did express what it's some, some those who were Muslim talk about Islam. Those who were Christian talks about, you know, Christianity, those and, and different denominations. And those who didn't believe in anything just talked about how Whatever it is that they believe in, really support them and help them navigate difficult situations. Or even uh, when they pray, they feel this answer. So there's, there's a lot that is involved there. So what I'm saying here is definitely, and Benin, uh, in Benin, for example, in Benin, like some African countries, uh, at least in Benin, I do 
know that there's separation between the state and, and you know, institutions of worship in general. So therefore, there's no church or mosque on the university. The public university don't allow that on, on campus. So I, you know, but the students are saying this is important to them, right? So how can we leverage spirituality, spirituality as a potential pathway to students' lives, right? Again, uh, I would say also that faculty, I mean, student, student involvement is also one of the predictors of students' lives. I am, when I spoke to students, for example, um, in exploring about the nature of their involvement, they talked about. A few talked about how participating in some student organization activities really help them integrate socially, but unfortunately the student organization do not have any form of funding from the university to operate, right? And they also, there's not any even like a centralized student um, you know, building where events and activities are happening there after school. So I, am, I think it is definitely important that the university, again, it's too early for me to make any sort of recommendation, uh, but I think financially supporting this organization and creating some form of structure for accountability, uh, since this is important to see them um, invested in this, I think it's definitely not a bad idea. This is faculty <coughs> student graphic is not um, you know, relevant, but cons I mean, research, particularly in this part of the world, have shown the relevance of this in student integration. So I, uh, again, um, particularly class size make it difficult for faculty have any meaningful interaction with students and um, the lack of office hours or academic advisors are definitely things that are uh, affecting also this relationship. But I, I don't know how realistic it is with a bigger number uh, of students in the classroom and, um, you know, or say high gap faculty student ratio. I don't know how realistic that this would be. But I, I think um, either having offices, staff of having offices that are staffed with particular individual who can perhaps in the first and second year with their big numbers who can help students perhaps with degree or with orientation or with some of basic advising. And my experience is also the higher you go in the educational ladder from the first to third year, the number reduces and then I've experienced more meaningful interaction with my faculty, with faculty when I was in my at the time I was in my third year because we were either fifty or hundred in the classroom. So Perhaps really, maybe in early in, in the first and second year, perhaps having an office on campus that is in charge, in charge of some basic level of uh, um, you know interaction with students in terms of advising for uh, resources that are on campus, or because the university that I, that has served on site for this institution is really really large and it enrolls over sixty thousand students. Right, it's it's like it does have some regional campuses, in, but where I went, we, we have at least at least at least on campus 30, 35 thousand students. Right, so it's, it's so huge. If you are coming from a very structured high school environment and from a rural place, it just makes them sometimes for people to lose themselves in such an environment. So I've been again, like I said, an office that really at least support first and second year students. By the third year, again, encourage faculty to have some meaningful advising with the, because this is office hours and, and academic advising that definitely non-existent at the University of Alabama where I did this research. And I also <coughs> think that, you know, as an early recommendation, these are my talk based on some of the, uh, some of the, and my findings, I would say, um, at least the three strongest predictors of thriving in my content with a session of uh, faculty still interaction are consistent with the current research day. If, if anything, they confirm what we know to some extent, even in, in, in the context that I did my research. But any time I present this, I, in this context, I've seen definitely people shot that faculty student interaction is not adding anything significant. Unfortunately, it is not, and there are reasons why it is not. And I do hope that you know, I get the opportunity to present this um, study, particularly you know, my dissertation, what I have done with uh, both phases to. Um, I am in conversation with the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research to present this research, and the uh, university is also, the leadership is willing to allow me to present this research to the university leadership and to some extent to the university community. What I have done, I, I, I always say this our job as you know, researchers is to do this, we're not policy makers, but um, we do research and say this is what you found and this is what you can do to improve this. And, up to them if they decide to do, but um, I hope that this helps influence the level of policies, uh, you know, at the university level. Um, 
So university, the resources that I use, I must say that the use from the library that really helped me make this out. I must say that the material really was they using the uh, short videos on the university web, on the library website. It's very really helpful in terms of organizing my resources. For example, um, when I was looking for uh, research on student successes, see how I categorize them on psychological perspective. I have folders that anytime I found something on the library website, I was just, um, you know, bounce it into a specific folder. It helped me organize my references and also my article based on themes. The higher link is definitely very, very helpful uh, in terms of finding books that are with you know, peer institutions or that are limited, you know, supply in the library here. So there's many books that I really needed from Jinto to others that there were limited copies here, but I was able to get it through the higher link. It's a library loan. A typical example here is um, uh, when before I uh, before I collected my qual qualitative data, I was definitely because I was my interview. I did my interview in French. I was looking for uh, um, something on cross cultural data collection, cross cultural and cross language data collection, and I found a book that the library didn't have at the time. It is still I don't think it's still here, but. Interlibrary loan made it possible for me to get that book and read, and I needed only a chapter in that book that speaks specifically about uh, you know, um, that aspect of my research, how do you collect data in a different language, that, that is in a different language, and how do you analyze that data. So the live chat, I never knew it was something that was really important to me. I was just curious, uh, early in this research, and then I was confused about, you know, Finding an article in a book and then I and then get instant help. I click on it and test it. Instantly, someone responded and I told them what I was looking for. And one, on one occasion, they sent me a link to to it. On the other occasion, they really find the book for me and um, and then I came in and pick it up. And I I don't know if uh, good if you remember, but early in when. When this before I even settled on on, on thriving, I, I was definitely looking to do something on strength based approaches to this exercise. I met with you a couple of times to do you know to you help me um, use the advanced feature of you know advanced source and the time. So I, that was really helpful in, in, in terms of definitely even understanding how to do that advanced research on the library website because it can be existing some kind of frustrating if you're not finding what you want. So you help me using some combinations of you know keywords and that really help me to get access to specific you know, resources that I, I wanted. Um, definitely my topic had evolved into what it has evolved and what I'm doing now, but um, I was able to use the same skills things that could help me to continue doing this. And I wanted to say thank you so much for your time. I wanted to open it up any thought, comments, or questions you may have. I have a question. Sure. Um, since you ended up talking about library resources, did you use library tools to engage in French language research at all? And if so, how did that go? Was it frustrating? Was it or did you not do that uh, much at all? No, I, I didn't, but I know I, I, I like I mentioned the books that are not those specifically on this front of the study, but in my call phase, definitely the book that I got from into a library loan, mm -hmm. that specific chapter that helps that talks about and in that in that chapter what the um, the authors use the collected language in, in Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. So they talked about the process how they went about collecting that data and how they went about strategies, strategies they use to analyze that data and report it, report the findings in general. And what they did, for example, that I found very creative is they did make sure that they use both Spanish and English. Like when they took a code, they first put it, they put it in, when they report it, they put it in, in, in Spanish, and then they have a translation, a direct translation underneath. But what was challenging for them is when they wanted to publish their research in, tradition, in traditional or conventional articles, I think they had a lot of, they couldn't fit, they couldn't fit that standard that they were looking for, so they had to put it in the book. But they resisted and said that no, like someone has to do this and that, you know, we can't, we've collected this data in Spanish, so we can't just transmit it in English because uh, that, and 
we use a lot of assets and originality already in the translation. So we want to make sure at least you see what the original data look like. Um, and that's why they did uh, the total solution they have in Spanish. And they have some you know, strategies that I'm, find, I'm hoping to adapt on and give my data analysis too. And it gives me some ideas on also really perhaps at uh, some point reflecting on what this experience means to me in terms of collecting the cross-cultural and language data and analysis and put something out there also for people who might be interested or, you know, in doing something similar, but who, uh, who that could probably be a starting point for them. And this speaks to also even doing research back home for me with challenges that really are this. Um, there's a lot of challenges in doing research back home, but someone has to do it. Right, and um, we can't, I, I think it's just important. For me, I think I would have accomplished something if someone from my part of the world wanted to do something and then found out that someone had done something and if they encourage them to do something, I think I've accomplished something. Because it's like, we, they can build a mind to do theirs, I think, from me to them to someone else would be the cause of corpus, right? And, but it was definitely, I didn't, there wasn't any, there were some literature in terms of uh, you know, the student experience, but student driving, there wasn't much in this literature really wouldn't have much implication in my own context, but I wanted to see what best practices. And I did not mean to use it literally in my own context, and that's why, um, even the instrument, I did the cross-cultural adaptation, which means that I had to do a backward tra forward translation, backward translation, expert panel reviews, piloting it, running confirmatory factor analysis, deleting items like academic advising or whatever it is that do not speak to experience with the participant. It's not a totally new instrument, but it is uh, an instrument that is relatively cross culturally adapted or might be made for. And my hope again is that um, public something with the validation and confirmatory sacramental information to tell people that hey this is available in French if you want to use it. Uh, this is a process and you can adapt it to your context and hopefully you would have contributed to something. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I think my first question was about uh, uh, the cross-cultural adaptation and I think you answered it at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, thinking first about the concept of spirituality mm -hmm. in the U.S. is like I had it about cultural stuff when I got here. Mm -hmm. On what counts as spirituality back home, and what counts as spirituality here. Right. So my question is now: Would, would your qualitative study allow for exploring other factors outside of the training? Yes. So I'm, I'm hoping I'm hoping that with the quality phase of my study, in addition to what we know in this context, what training means to students in this context, I'm hoping that based on experiences of my participants. They either confirm what tribal means in this sentence and also talk about what it means to them, and hopefully some other factors will emerge as to what tribal means. It's too early. I did definitely, there were a few stuff that were really coming up that Doris Ryan didn't definitely based on my readings of what can, what really tribal means, particularly theoretically, and then practically grounded in research. There were a few stuff that are. Um, I want to refrain from sharing those, but there are a few stuff that are definitely emerging that I don't necessarily take it into account that really not very different, but the, what it means to them, and, and what it means to my participants in their own context. But I'm hoping to get to it. I'm very curious, and then when I started this, I, I was definitely hoping that the explanatory phase of the study, which is the qualitative phase of the study, would help uncover some factors that may be um, you know, didn't, were not either relevant in this context or were just different based on my personal experience. Thank you. We do have a couple questions from our online audience. Sure. Uh, the first would be, what factors influence your choice of sample size? All right, so I talked about, for example, a regression analysis, for example, for every predicted as a specific, depending on, you know, what uh, you know, effect size you use, depending on the uh, status score and that's that you want to run for regression, for example, what I, what the, the effect size, for example, what I, what I did using a specific method in terms of that sample size, I, 
I look at my effect size, and then I use a specific um, you know, method that allows me to determine a number of predict a number of uh, participants per predictor, right? Uh, but I did have more than I was, based on, because I think I had four uh, independent variables, and it was, if we're looking at thriving with the five different soft skills, that's nine. So I was looking for about 30 per predictor, or 30 per factor. So I, I think I needed about 280, where I ended up having more than that in terms of that. But if we're also talking about my sample population, I told, I say, really what was particular about them was um, how they come from the dual track system, right? They, that all these participants come from, um, you know, this low paying and less selective. And as someone who has been through that, I, I think my experiences are the experiences I've seen. Uh, there are times when I had class at 8, I had to be there at 6 or 5.30 so I can get a seat in front to listen to the professor. So I, I know there's a lot, at least as someone who's been through, I know there's a, a lot of challenges related to attending those, but many of us have made it through the system, but I'm just curious about the specific population that is making it, what is special about them, or what are they doing, or what is supporting them, what is helping them. Uh, I hope I... There is a follow-up question. Yes. Uh, in the qualitative data collection stage, how many participants will the researcher interview and how will or did the researcher approach that process of drawing out participants for the qualitative data collection? Yeah, so I didn't even know it's not the purpose of this presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So I, I did interview 20, 20 people and because this is an explanatory sequential mixed method, which means that I'm following a specific significant result and understanding why, which means that my core phase is mostly focusing on the predictors that were significant. I wanted to understand based on student, um, my participant experience, why and how that was contributed to the experience. So I grounded my, my interview questions were around those three predictors, but I also did ask some additional questions to explore the faculty student interaction. Uh, in addition to the additional criteria for selecting my participant, we also I look at because of diversity in my there's gender expression. I look at there's some that are first gen, some that are not first gen. I also make sure because my participant came from the 12th region of the country, I also make sure that there's some representation across that. But my main focus are um, those three, those three predictors. And if they're wondering how did I, if I use the same sample, is this a subsample? The same people who feel my survey, in the survey, I, there was a question, there was a, an item that tells them they will follow up to the study that's voluntary to further explore the experiences. If they're willing to participate, they can either leave their, um, uh, they can leave their email <coughs> so I can contact them. So what I did is, after I, I, uh, after I analyzed my quantitative data, I sent another, I sent another round of email and also follow up a specific phone number and said, hey, um, I'm ready to do this, and you've indicated that you, you, know, you would um, be available to participate in this, and I would like to interview you about so, 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 so. And that's how I went about recruiting my participant for, for the quarter, for the quarter phase. Yeah. Amar, the, um, Dr. Schreiner's instrument, as you translated it, have you, um, Talk to her about the translation. Did you get to any points where it was like you had difficulty finding translations from clear translations from English to French? Yeah, there's actually none. There's, there's no. There's no. I couldn't find any translation. I mean, there were some practice in terms of how to translate the instrument, and one of the one of the ones that I really adapted was the cross cultural adaptation process. But I did obtain her permission. I talked to her about the process. She's been very excited about the process that this is going to be available in a different language and different context for people. And um, we talked, we went back and forth um, about, unfortunately, she hasn't been able to participate in the process of that, but I did um, explain the process to her and who I was hoping to use as for my expert panel. Um, the expert, so let me just go back to the process, how it did all happen. So the forward translation just meant that um, the original instrument was translated from English to French. So I used three independent translators, two different translators who are, whose uh, first language is French, but they have a good command of the English language. 
and they're professional um, translators from my work in the UN. They're all my peers. We all had the dreams of becoming the interpreter. I also have a training in translations. Uh, some of them are conference interpreters working with the UN or ECOWAS or African Union. So they, three of them, I did trans, I did my own translation too. So we were, there were four of us. Three of them did the independent translation without really even knowing. And then we, we hop on a um, Zoom call to do what um, in this process is called expert panel reviews, where we came together to look at the four translations. And we went item by items and talk about it, and everyone explained the rationale behind why they translated so, I mean, a specific item in different ways. And we were able to agree and synthesize and agree on one translation. All right, so but that, those, that expert panel reviews, I remember the, for the first one, it took us over a week because we had to do like an hour, 30 minutes, or two hours. Sometimes by the time you're on the fifth question, one hour is gone. And I have to be flexible because I wasn't paying them. They just friends who are supporting me, and they have to work with their schedules. So sometimes it's just one hour, sometimes two hours. But it was a lengthy process. Right after that, Right after that, I did what they call backward translation. So that, that sympathized translation, the one that we agreed on, the French translation, I gave it. I also found three other translators who are the, not the, you know, different than the one that I used for the forward translation. Those people are, have English as their first language, right? And, but they have a good command of the French language because they are using those pair language in their professional activities as translators or conference interpreters. So they, they took the, the French translation and translated it back into English. Right, when they did that, we met again, and did, I also did the same thing. We met and did a, a round of exit panel reviews, and then I showed them the original English version from China and said, let's compare this and see any discrepancies. There were sentences that were not the same, but the meanings were really, we were not aiming for a linear translation or having a glass we were aiming for conceptual understanding. And also, in the French language, we also we we also um, focuses on you know, current expressions that are expressions that are really common, uh, you know, in, in Francophone African countries, or particularly to Benin. And so I made sure also those who translated with me for the French version are also people who have experience as a student or who have also been through that specific university. So that's kind of the process, and then. Um, pilot it. I have to interview a few students and see if, the, if they have any difficulty understanding the items. If they do, what are the items, what are the words that created confusion, and then I pilot the instrument and run some CFA, the Chrome Back Alpha level, um, 80 from 80 to 90, but pretty good, uh, definitely showing that the instrument is um, you know, measuring where it's measuring. But I didn't find any existing translation, but I found translation of other instrument that helped inform my process. And I did share that with uh, Dr. Schreiner, just so she has an idea of the process. And she did tell me what, she's told me what items are really critical in the instrument that she's, that she's she just wants to make sure that the meanings of those items, which is the 25, first 25 questions that speak to the five factors of tribe, which was definitely very adamant and insisted that those should, you know, I should pay attention to those because they're the main items on the instrument. Whatever comes, you can play around those. Like the different predictors are, there's certain things on the instrument that are important but not as important as the five factors of traveling themselves. So I definitely did make sure that she understand the process and uh, that, the, and also that as she asked me about the advantages of doing what I'm doing, I did share and I think she likes it and allowed me to. So much. Um, before we give a final round of applause to thank Omar for this excellent contribution already to scholarship, I'm super excited to see your finished work. Um, please join us on Friday when we welcome our next graduate research series presenter, Faustina Mensa. Um, <coughs> thank you for coming. Uh, thank you to the online audience, and thank you most of all for coming.
Yeah. 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 Yeah.